So this evening, uh, we're now up to uh, fifth, in, fifth in the series. We're looking at managing share events. Now, because we're trading, just because we're trading uh, 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 derivatives over a share, we oftentimes might think they're not important, but they're critical. And in truth, we start at the share level, and that's obviously we'll go through that, and then the implication as it tricks down. And we'll look at some stuff around new listings and suspended shares and how those play out at the, at the same time um, as well. Um, and then we're back again. Last one is 2nd of December, and then we take a break until uh, latish in January when we're back again in the, in the new year. What we are going to be doing, and that should have changed the slide, um, maybe from December, but certainly from Jan. If folks want, we'll set up some training sessions sort of half an hour before in the auditorium next door around the IG website, using the charts, navigating that if you're interested. But Mariska will manage that process there. Um, so the first four that we've done, these videos are all online. They're getting started in trading, which is really the, the, the first step. Margin, leverage, and exposure, <clears throat> excuse me, which really is what trading is all about. That, that's what trading is. It's managing risk, but, but within that sits that margin, how much you put down, what is your gearing effect, and what's your overall portfolio exposure that you have in that space. Um, a trading plan, and I, and I make this comment all the time, it's less about the quality of the plan, it's more about having a plan. And if you don't have a plan, quite simply we plan to fail, it's about having a plan. And if it's not, even if it's only a second-rate plan, it, it puts you ahead of most people because they simply don't have a plan. And then last month we looked at global trading. Um, or investing. Uh, I was chatting just before we started. Five years ago, getting exposure to international markets was difficult. Ten years ago, it was impossible. Um, today, it's very, very simple. Whether you want to buy ETFs or equities, whether you want to uh, be, be trading futures, CFDs or options, whatever the case may be, it really is significantly easier. And most most countries are available. And for example, you can't go and buy individual stocks on the Russian Stock Exchange. Probably a good thing, but you can go buy an ETF on the Russian Stock Exchange. Probably not a good thing. Um, but you know, the markets are there. There's almost no corner of the world that we can't get into contact anymore. So they're online. If you go to justonelap.com, you find them there. If you go to YouTube, you'll find them. And then every, every, every session we kick off, we, we start and we end with a particular quote. And this one um, from Alan Farley, and I'll be honest, I've never heard of Alan, but experienced con trader, traders control risk, inexperienced traders chase gains. And that's critically important. Trading is about discipline. Trading is about managing risk in that process. And you know, that, that last part is absolutely true. Why, did, why, why does anyone start trading? No one starts trading to get rich slowly. We start trading because we want to be rich in a hurry. And when I say a hurry, I'm talking Friday tea time. I'm talking morning tea because I've got plans for the afternoon. And let's be honest, I mean, that's, that's certainly that's why I started trading. You know, I, I, was, I must have been, what, I was in my mid-20s. I didn't start it so that I could make money over the following decades. Nonsense. I started trading so that I could be rich within a couple of months and sort of uh, retire to the hills of KZN. Um, and so we chase those returns. And what do we do when we're chasing the returns? We... we we buy Kumba at, 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 at uh, 60 bucks because it's on a PE of 2, and then it goes to 50, and now it's on a PE of 1.8. But it's, I mean, we chase those returns. We buy the high risk, and most times, no hopers, in the hope that something does go right for us. Because we, you know, we, we don't want a 10 bagger, we need a 100 or a 1,000 bagger, and we, we desperately need it to kick off. And it doesn't work. You know, we, we, we buy the high-risk stuff, and as normally happens with high-risk, it lives up to its billing and it collapses in a heap. Trading's about managing that risk. It's about stop losses. It's about 2% rules. It's about making sure that we're not over-leveraged or overexposed. It's about not going long off Kumba, Lonman, uh, Anglo, uh, Harmony, and Goldfields and thinking I'm diverse because I've got five mines. You're not diverse. You're just someone who's losing a vast amount of money because you're 100% you're in the resource space. So more than anything, it's about managing that risk. And then the flip side of that coin is, frankly, managing yourself. And those are both going to be sessions on their own we will get to. So this evening, looking at, at share events and their various different uh, uh, makeups and, and, and designs, and I thought the one we touch on, of course, is, is new listings when they come to market. And we see stocks like Signia, which had an IPO of 8 Rand 40 and is trading around 15 or 16 Rand uh, a month later, less than a month later. Um, we can go to Anchor Capital, who had an IPO price of two rand, um, and what are they, a year and a half in, maybe two years into their life on the market, and trading at 15 rand. 
Um, and those are ungeared moves. Those are absolutely spectacular. And we're always, those are what we're always looking at. So I thought we'd run through that. The main first process of how stocks get in the market, an initial public offering. This is the old-fashioned way of doing it, where a company comes, issues a prospectus on the JSC. Um, and important around that is it is a public offering. In other words, everybody can partake. And certainly if you look at the, the previous bull market up to 2007, all new listings were public offerings rather than private placements and reverse listings and the like. And, and then nuances, I'll touch on that in a second. The thing with a public offering is that everyone can have it, you know, your stockbroker, you've got to go via a broker, but every broker will offer it. Everyone will get exactly the same terms. In other words, if it's oversubscribed, everyone gets the same percentage and the same amount and, and all of that. And then you've got your shares and, and off it goes and runs. And there's the rules and requirements around it in terms of what needs to be published and timelines and, and, and all of that sort of stuff is, is, is part of the, the JC listing requirements. Um, whereas a private placement is distinctly different in that it's private rather than public. So if we look at, uh, um, for example, Signia, they were a private placement, which means not every broker could offer the shares because they weren't invited. So if I didn't invite you and your clients to partake, then your clients couldn't partake. Further to that, when they allocate shares, they can allocate as they deem fit. So they could give you 100 and you 50 for no good reason except that they wanted to do it that way. Um, it gives them full discretion in that space. As a shareholder, I, I prefer the IPO. Uh, private placement isn't that horrible as long as your broker has, you know, has it offered. And if your broker never gets the private placements, the question is why? Um, and in the allocation, they're not really going to shaft people too much. Key point is they're coming to market. Question, why do companies want to list? Broadly, to raise money. Uh, they, they need some capital. They can do a couple of things. They can borrow from fool's friend and family. They can borrow from banks. They can go to bond markets. They need some capital to, to get onto the market. Um, and they do it via a listing. In other words, they give up part of the company, uh, but they get cash for it. So I own a company, 100% of it. I list it, and I only own 40%, but the company's bigger because I've got a pile of cash at the base, and I can use that cash to grow it. And that's what, 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 what stock markets do best. But there are other reasons why companies list as well. They might list for profile. I mean, in the case of Signia, I don't think they needed the money. I think Signia needs that public profile. They need to have uh, uh, accounts that are publicly audited. So that for that their potential clients, they play in the same space as Alexander Forbes. If you're a giant corporate and you want to you know, have a company look after your, 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 your staff members' retirement and the like, you want that sort of scrutiny and disclosure that comes from a JSC listing. The other reason companies list is to sell. In other words, I own a company and I want to now exit it. And I'm tired of owning this company. I want to sell it. Um, and if you sell a company privately in the pages of the Sunday Times or anywhere else, typically you're going to be hard-pressed to sell a company at a PE of much more than six or eight times. So you sell it maybe six or eight times earnings. Of course, industry, you know, there's all those different nuances, but broadly six or eight times is, is about as much as you're going to get. You sell it in the stock market, Signia listed at 20. So, you, you know, you get a, a lot more for it. I am, I am exceedingly wary of companies where it's the founders exiting. Hang on a second, you're selling, and make no mistake, you're telling me it's a great business, so why are you, ex why are you selling? You know, it's like someone comes and says, I've got this brilliant car, it's a lovely car, it's the best car in the whole, well, don't you want to buy it from me? It's like, hang on, you said it's a great car, why do you want to sell it? Oh, I don't like the color. No, you need a better story than that. Um, and we've seen some of those in the last, uh, uh, in the last little bit, and, and we're certainly seeing a couple more coming through. Companies where it is quite clear that it's existing shareholders who are looking to exit. And that is their right. That is not illegal. That's not even unethical. It's just as a shareholder, we've got to say, why is this company doing it? You know, if we look at Baldwin, why are they doing it? They, they're raising capital. They need money to expand. Okay, that's cool. Others... And I'm purposely not saying names because I know that they're going to come and harass me. I said, Tredidor. Tredidor is listing for one good reason. 51% of the shareholders sold their shares to exit the business. And they're telling me this is a great business, but 51% of shareholders wanted to sell. That's half of the current shareholders don't think it's a great business. Put it that way. Um, so the trick with the private placement, restricted initial public offering open to all. 
And then sometimes you get a reverse listing, and we've seen very few of them. The JC does allow it, but they're not. So you've got a little company that, that's kind of got nothing in it and nothing much happening, a cash shell, small little market cap. So what happens is, is they issue a whole bunch of new shares to a, a, th a third company who then essentially take control of it and come into the stock market that way. Essentially, it's a backdoor listing in a sense. Again, perfectly legal. The reason we don't see many of them anymore is that the acquiring company who is doing the reverse listing often finds a lot more rats and mice in the company that they acquired than they expected. So there's this little company in the JSC, not doing very well, no liquidity, no business, no assets, etc. They issue a whole bunch of new shares. You take them, you get the company, and then suddenly when you open the cupboards, you find all sorts of stuff in the cupboards. So yeah, it's cheaper, but oftentimes it's not cheaper after you've actually run through it. Um, and then the fourth way, which is, we see it a bit, is the unbundling process. So, and we see what's the most recent unbundling, um, mine gone blank, but Tiger Brands has unbundled a whole bunch. They spun off Spa, Adcock Ingram, um, we saw Remgro spin off Implats, we saw HCR spin off Mowalk, is that how I pronounce it? Uh, and again, I have a simple issue. So a large company owns a, a subsidiary and they no longer want to own it. What's the first thing they try and do? Sell it. And they can't sell it. What's the second thing they try and do? They give it to existing shareholders. There are exceptions to it. Uh, SPA is a great unbundling. Uh, PPC, not so much. Um, Adcock Ingram and Hansart, not so much. I mean, Remgro unbundled Transhex and Implats. They did them both at significantly higher prices. Make no mistake, Remgo tried to sell the implants so they could get the cash and redeploy it. And they were unable to, so they basically passed it on to share, small shareholders, well, on to poor suffering shareholders. Problem is simple, particularly for a small private client, is you end up with like 27 Impala shares. You know, collectively they're worth like 1,200 Rand. You, know, you had a decent holding in Remgo, but you, you Impala, you know, and you your cost of equity, there's no efficiencies in cost and the like. That there's nothing you can do about it. If you hold the stock and they unbundle, then you receive it and then you're stuck with it. If you don't like it, sell it, take the hit. What's important is that they don't always pop. So we look at Signia, we look at Anchor, and we think this is the most exciting thing ever. This is an easy way to make free money, um, and we get all terribly excited. And, and certainly Signia has done spectacularly well, Anchor has as well. Traded or not, listed at 6, trading at 5 around 50 this afternoon. Borwin listed at 9.88, trading at 9.50 this afternoon. So they don't always pop. So what are we looking for to see if a company is going to pop? What you need is for them to be in hot spaces. So let's look at Signia and Anchor, both in exactly the same space, asset management. A hot sector right now. Look at Coronation. Now Coronation's had a terrible 2015, but look further out at Coronation, done spectacularly well. Look at Peregrine. Asset management's a hot space. I mean, should it be, is it, I mean, all of that we can debate, but from a pure fundamental perspective, it's a hot space. If PSG lists something, just buy it. I mean, you can, you know, PSG or Masters, you can close your eyes and buy it. So it's what's being listed and why is it being listed? What's the rationale behind it? You know, and your ball wins 988, you could have sold them at 1105 on day one, you could have made yourself 10%. 10% is not shabby return for one day. Even 5% in one day is absolutely a, a great return. But you've got to look <clears throat> for that hype. You've got to see, you want it to be getting spoken about a lot. You know, you, you want bunches of folks, I'll be in a moment, Colin. You want bunches of people. You want CNBC and, and, and Business Day TV to guests talking about it. You want to see it being spoken about on Twitter, on chat forums. You want broad excitement around this listing. Well, you're down 10% of your investment. And, and it, it's just looking weak. So it came in at six and it's now 550 and falling, not positive. You want broad, you, so you want the right sector, you want broad excitement from it. I, I, I very seldomly do IPOs. The previous one I did, I did a Signia. I got Baldwin, but I'm doing Baldwin for the good old fashioned, I want to hold it. Um, not enjoying that, but nonetheless. Um, whereas what you call, what I call, it's called stagging, where you buy a stock and IPO with the sole intention of selling it a short period thereafter. Um, <clears throat> I did Signia, I did Advanced Healthcare, which was about two years ago. So I haven't done many, because most of our listings have been in property, and there's, there's no excitement and hype in property. Stocks are done well, but you want that hype. 
You want the people to be talking about it. You want it on Twitter. You want folks like Anthony Clark to be saying, whoa, this is going to be brilliant. I mean, say what you will about Anthony Clark. He gets a lot of his calls right, and he can spot a, a, a hyped IPO from about 50 paces probably, maybe 100 with his glasses on. So it's about looking for that hype, looking for that excitement, looking for that right sector. It has to be the right sector. If you list a mining company right now, there ain't nothing you can do to make that thing pop on day one. And then, of course, what happens is that the more, mar the more listings we have, the more likely we are at the top of a market, aren't we? Because why, why do you, you don't want to list at the bottom of a market when valuations are depressed and you're listing your company at a PE of 10. There's no attraction to that. You want to list in the market when it's at the top of a market and you can list at a PE of 20. You know, take the Signia example. They raised, what did they raise? 236 million. If the PE was only 10, they would have raised uh, 118 million. Not shabby, but half the amount of the money. So what, and the, the, you will see every, every severe market correction. Uh, the dot-com boom was preceded by a listing boom of epic proportions. South Africa, but even more so in the US. 2007, we saw the absolute massive listing boom of all these small little old tech stocks, one time being one of them and a whole bunch of others that didn't manage to survive the process. And what this does mean is the listing boom we're seeing right now ticks another box to say we're at a market top. That doesn't mean our market is about to correct today, this week, this year, maybe not even next year. But there's a bunch of things you need to have in place for a market top to happen. And there, there are a bunch of them. One is high valuations. Current market valuation about an 18, 18 and a half price earnings ratio. Long term average about 14, 14 and a half. There's a tick in the box. Uh, IPO listing boom, absolutely tick in the box. Uh, what else are we seeing? Rising interest rates, another tick in the box. So slowly as we start seeing them coming through, it's more and more warning signs. What do we do about it? Nothing. You know, we can panic and sell everything, but that seldom works. We kind of ignore it. It will come. Many of these signs have been around for over a year, and our market is still chugging along just off the all-time highs. What's critical? If you are a derivative trader, you are almost never, I, I'm going to say you are unable to get listings ahead. So you can't on day one receive a CFD. You would have to go and buy the CFD on day one. Which in the case of Signia, for example, so the IPO price was 840, the first trade was about 1350. So you would have got your CFD at 1350. So that first five rand of move you wouldn't have made any money on. But in truth, we don't need gearing. And I'm not sure we want gearing. You know, let's take the, the Treaty Door, and it's not as extreme, but Treaty Door's down almost 10%. You gear that, you're 50, 60% down. Um, Signia, 840, you could have sold your Signias at 1680. You could have made 100% in two weeks, no gearing. Why gear it? You know, why add the risk? I know why we want to gear it, because if we gear it sevenfold, we then made 700%, and boom, we're going to be rich by Friday. Unless, of course, Signia flopped. Eventually, one of these ticks all the boxes. Hype, excitement, right sector, Anthony Clark loves it. Ticks every box, and it fails. One time, in the 2007 listing boom, it was one time. There was massive hype. There was humongous excitement. Um, I didn't get sucked in because I got a simple rule. Don't buy airlines, ever. And IPO price in one time was a buck. First trade was 98 cents. Never traded over a rand. End of first day, closed at 90 cents. And that was it. That was uh, March 2008. And it all just went pear-shaped from there on out. So we don't care it. If you want it, just get into the normal. Go via the front door, get the equity, make your money that way. Pull your wrist down, give yourself occasional opportunity ahead of it. So it doesn't push it up ahead because what happens is when the company announces their IPO, they've got to do two things. They've got to say how many shares and what price. So suddenly there's huge demand. They can't issue more shares or more price. What that demand does do is it means on day one. So what happened with Signia, they listed... 100 million shares, they got application for 2 billion, which meant there was, you know, 100 and whatever number of shares, what, uh, 1.9 billion shares people wanted. That was what the excitement was. You know, so my allocation in Signia was 4%. I applied for X, I got 4% of X, which was massively small. Importantly, in the private placements, they can be more vague. They can be more vague at the price, 
and they can be more vague in the quantity. In other words, they say, we plan to issue a quantity of shares between 1 and 2 million, and at a price between 8 and 10 rand. Everyone who wants shares, tell us what quantity and what price you want. Basically, they do an auction. So in the case of Tredidor, their range was between 6 and 7, and it came in at 6. In the case of Baldwin, the range was between 8.50 and 9.88. It came at 9.88. So in the private placement, you can do a range. In an IPO, you've got to say this quantity, that price. So free float, so say there's 1,000 shares. Say I've got a company, and there are 1,000 shares, but I own 900 of them, and I have no intention of selling. That leaves only 100 shares in the free float which means that in, technically there's a lot less available. So free float is critically important. The smaller the free float, if we have got hype and excitement in a small free float, that's what pushes it even higher still. And that's what PSG are masters of. You know, so, so Capitec, for example, they've got 35% of Capitec. So although technically there's 50 billion rands with the Capitec shares out there, no, you've got to take a third and give them to PSG, which suddenly means there's only 33 billion rands with the Capitec shares. Because there's a amount of money fighting for those Capitec shares. If there's less of them, then that pushes price. Tell you who is a master of this is Yanni Maton, PSG. So you'll see that they do two things incredibly crafty. They will do rights issues on their shares when they're expensive. So they keep on doing rights issues on Capitec. Nothing for the last couple of years. And I interviewed Yanni Maton once. I said, why are you doing a rights issue on Capitec? You don't need the money. He said, look, we don't need the money, but this thing's in a PE of 70, we'll take the money. So they do rights issues at the top, and they do share buybacks at the bottom. And that's the right way you want to do it. Most companies, Lonman, other way around. They're buying shares at the top, and they're doing rights issues at the bottom. So what are you doing? Essentially, you're, 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 you're buying at the top and selling at the bottom. You should be doing it the other way around. Selling at the top, buying at the bottom. And PSG are masters. Uh, Signia did it brilliantly well, as did Anchor. Dividends. So most investors ignore dividends. I think it's true to say that pretty much every trader ignores dividend because you're not there for a measly half a percent or one percent you know, payment on the share. You're there to get rich by Friday, tea time, you have plans for the afternoon. But dividends are critically important, not only as part of a, as a return, but as a trader, they, you, there's a bunch you've got to understand. Otherwise, you expose yourselves to, to unneeded risks more than anything else. So let's run through all of this, and, and, and you might know lots of it. Bear with me. We'll catch up in time. Declare date. Company publishes results. They will declare a dividend. They don't have to publish results. They can just declare a dividend if they want. Obviously, it has to be a board meeting, approves the dividend, um, and then they issue a sense declaring that dividend. With that, they will give you the last day to trade, ODT. If you hold the share at the close, excuse me, of trading on that ODT, you receive the dividend. When you bought the share, not important. You could buy it, at 10, you could buy it in the closing auction. You can buy it at 5 o'clock. If you're holding the share at the close, you get the dividend. The thing is, is that from when it's declared to when it's ODT, it's essentially carrying a div. We call it cum div. It's carrying the div. The person who's selling it to you knows that they're also selling away a dividend. So as long as you hold it on the, at the close of last day to trade, you are entitled to the dividend. You could then sell the share first thing the next morning. You are still entitled to the dividend. As long as you hold that share, you receive the dividend. I've got shares I've held for 20 years. They've sent me a dividend check every six months for 20 years. And as long as I continue to hold it, I continue to get that dividend. The X date is the day immediately after LDT. So LDT is usually a Friday, so we've got a share that's paying a dividend on Friday. You hold the share at 5 o'clock on Friday. Monday will be the X date. The stock will normally fall by that dividend amount. You've got a 10 rand share at the close on Friday, and it's paying a 1 rand dividend. On Monday, the share opens at 9 rand. Because you as the shareholder have now got 1 rand in cash. That one rand fall, if the market is extremely bullish on that day, it might only fall 85 cents. If the market's having a really bad day like today and getting, getting battered, it might fall a buck 30. But it'll broadly fall by that dividend amount. If it's a quality company, it recatches that dividend quite quickly. And here's the point. So you come along and you look at this and you think, easiest money in the world, right? So all I do is I short the share on Friday at 10 rand. On Monday, it opens at 9 rand. I close my position. I've made 1 rand on the downside. Boom. No. Because you had to pay the dividend. 
I'll touch on that in a moment. You had to pay it. If you're trading options, if you're trading futures, they've smoothed the dividend out of the, out of the process. <clears throat> but I remember way back in the 90s, I thought this was how I was going to get rich. I was going to buy options, put options at 4, at four o'clock. In those days, the market closed at 4. But I put options at 4 o'clock on the Friday, sold them at 10 o'clock on the Monday, because that's what time the market opened, and I'll just make money. And I didn't. For six months, I didn't make money until eventually I asked someone. And I'll come to that in a moment. Pay date. <coughs> Last day to trade. You're entitled to it, but you usually only get the money a week later. The company only pays it a week later. And sometimes they might pay it a lot later. Um, Old Mutual once did a pay date that was like four months later. And they're perfectly entitled to do that. The thing is, the stock is no longer cum div. It's no longer, it doesn't matter. It's no longer applicable in a case. Um, what some companies will, 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 will also do um, is they will, they will so, so the, the last day to trade, they, they, they determine that date themselves. As I said, it's typically a Friday. If there's a public holiday in the week following the last day to trade, they might move it to a Thursday. That's just semantics. We don't really mind about that. Watch out for dividends that are declared in foreign currencies. BHP Billiton declares a dividend in US dollars. So they then publish a conversion rate at the same time. At some, not, not at the same time, but just before they pay the dividend, they will publish the conversion rate. And say we're paying you 50 US cents, the exchange rate was 14.20, ergo you get whatever the case is, $7.10, whatever, whatever it might be, $7.05. And then there's something called dividend withholding tax. In South Africa, we pay 15%. But, uh, for example, if you hold Richmond, the Swiss government withholds 30 percent. We can 35, sorry, 35. We can claim that 20 that difference back, but we've got to submit the documents to Richmond in Switzerland and do all the paperwork. And Richmond, bless their dear hearts, post us the documents. So what you actually have to do is go onto their website, download it, fill it in, send it off, and you get back 20 percent of your div of your dividend. Depends how much PT is, well, the PT is there, but it depends how much it is. You know, if you're going to get back five bucks, yeah, maybe not worth it. Thousand bucks, yeah, an easy way to make yourself that 5,000 rand. The real point comes in dividends and derivatives. And here I'm looking at CFDs. As distinct from options and futures, look at CFDs. If you are long, you receive the dividend. By long, you have bought the share and you're looking for it to rise higher and you will make money on the upside. If you are short, you have sold something you don't own on the expectation that it will fall and you'll make money on the downside. So if you long, you receive it. If you short, you pay the dividend. So if I'm short that share on Friday at 10 Rand and Monday it opens at 9 Rand, I've made one buck per share in my trading account. But I sold that share to somebody. I sold it to you. And you expect that dividend. I legally have to pay it. So I've made one rand in my trading account from the trade, but I've had to pay the rand out. So I'm net, net flat. Now that process, I don't have to ring around and say, who's got my shares? Uh, it'll just happen. The JC will just manage it. That process will just sort of happen. No problem at all. But there are a couple of issues. First issue, when do you get the dividend? So let's take a position where you are long. The share is 10 Rand on Friday. Monday it opens at 9 Rand. Your position has dropped to Rand. You're losing money. No problem, you've got a 1 Rand dividend. When do you get it? If you only get it on pay date, which might be a week later, might be months later, you've got to carry that dividend. Now, I want to say a lot, but I won't. I will say some CFD companies. The, the CFD trading houses that I know, what they do is they pay you on X date. So on Monday, your share falls around. You've lost one round, but you've received one round. So they pay you on, on, on that X date, just to keep your portfolio in sync. Otherwise, things get all shades of messy. So what's critically important, if you're looking for a CFD broker, is say to them, when do you pay dividends? And if they do it on pay date, 
it might be worth shopping around and finding someone who does it on X date. You know, one buck's fine, but if you're short a whole bunch of something, it can start getting a little bit hairy. And technically, you could start moving into closeout territory. And then real or manufactured. So a dividend that you receive from a company is quantified as a dividend by the Companies Act, by the listing requirements of the JSC, and SARS has overseen and National Treasury have signed off on this. And ergo, you are, it is of after-tax proceeds. So it's profit after tax that the company has made. That is a legal requirement. And then it is taxed at 15% withholding tax. In other words, a one-round dividend gets declared, but you get 85 cents. But if you're holding a CFD, you don't actually have the share. So what do you get? So some, some brokers will do what they call a manufactured dividend, which is where SARS has basically said, okay, we agree that you can pass the dividend on without losing its dividend status. Some brokers will pay you cash. There's a key difference. A manufactured dividend, instead of getting one rand, you just got 85 cents. So you have 15 cents in the hole. Not too bad. If you get cash, you get the full one rand. But that cash has a tax liability. In essence, it's income. It gets taxed at your marginal tax rate. Not today, but when you do your tax return at the end of the year, that cash dividend goes into monies received. It's income. It's revenue. So it potentially has a tax implication. So it swings in roundabouts, and I can't get my head around which one I prefer. I suppose it depends what your marginal tax rate is. If your marginal tax rate is 10%, well, then, then you want the cash. But if your marginal tax rate is 40%, um, you, know, you can offset. The point is, to me, it's less about manufactured or real. To me, it's more about when. That hit there. So here's why. Because the manufactured, I pay 15%. There's nothing I can do. The real, remember that if you're a trader, how does tax work? You pay tax on your profits. What are profits? Income less costs. So that dividend was an income. But costs are trading fees. Costs are losing trades. If you were paying for the parking this evening, that would be a cost. And on that point, as you head out under the TV, stamp your parking ticket, you won't pay for the parking. Um, if you subscribe to Finweek, that is a deductible cost. So suddenly you can actually re reduce your tax liability in the trading space down by all of these costs. And the obvious one, brokers, you know, brokerage rates, admin fees, data fees, and all of that sort of thing. And, and you can push that. I, I, I think I've told the story before. I've got a friend in Durban. His name's Hagar. His name's not Hagar, but I met him on a chat forum, and he called himself Hagar. Um, and we meet occasionally. We drink beer and talk shares. And all we do is drink beer and talk shares. I, I, I saw him last time, and I discovered that he has a 22-year-old kid. I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? It's like I've always had a kid. I've known the guy 15 years. I didn't know he had, well, 15 years ago, the kid was seven. Point being is all we have in common is shares. So I get the bill, and I put it to tax. It's like this is a cost of trading. And, and if SARS have never argued it, but if they had, I would say, phone Trevor and ask him how many children I have. He won't be able to answer. You know, we talk shares. Is it possible to talk shares for six hours? Hell yeah, especially with enough beer. So anything in pursuit of? <clears throat> Questions on dividends? Obviously, when the cash is in your account, it accrues, but otherwise not. In a trader's life, dividends are small. The issue is know how they operate. And don't be surprised by the if short you pay. So capital raising, now we start to get to some fun stuff. And this can get really, really hairy for, for, for traders. Um, the first level of capital raising, of course, is when a stock lists on the market. But then a company has been listed on the market and decides they need more money. In the case, for example, of Lonman, they need money to try and survive. In the case of MTN, they might need money to pay Nigeria. And that is purely speculative. We have no confirmation of anything from MTN except that the boss fight got jumped. Um, a company needs money. Again, they can do many things. They can borrow money, etc. They will at times decide to issue more shares to raise cash. This is the last thing you want to do. If I go to a bank and I borrow money, 
eventually after some period of time I've paid back the money plus the interest and I have no more liability there but I have whatever I borrowed it for. So let's say I borrow a thousand rand to buy a, a tractor. I buy my tractor, I pay back uh, a thousand rand plus interest, so I pay back a thousand two hundred rand, but now I own a tractor and I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. But nonetheless, I own a tractor. Um, the other way of doing it is the rights issue, where in essence you sell rights to it. If you issue more shares, what is a share? A share has a perpetual, lifelong right to future profits. A debt does not. I pay back a debt. That's it. Obligation over. This is like saying to someone, I don't want to buy a tractor. You give me the tractor and what I will do is every Friday at 4 o'clock I'll make you a cup of tea for the rest of my life. And for the first couple of weeks that's quite fun. But in three years time I want to go to Singapore and it's like, oh, I can't. I've got to make tea on Friday. You issue more shares, you are, that share gives somebody else a perpetual right to a part of the profit. So it dilutes, the, it makes, you know, makes the, 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 the pie, the whole lot, well, it makes more slices in the pie, same size, more slices. And it means when the profit gets ponied up, you get less profit. It's called dilution. So it, issuing new shares for cash is not a great idea unless you can issue them at crazy valuations like PSG does. We call it a rights issue. A rights issue has to go to existing shareholders first. So what a rights issue is, let's take the example of Lonman. They have announced a rights issue. There are a couple of important terms. What they have said, for every, and again, there will be an LDT. Excuse me, if you hold the share in the LDT, you get those, those nil paid letters. They will say to you, for every one Lonman share that you hold, you will receive 48 nil paid letters. Every nil paid letter entitles you to buy one new Lonman share and the price of that Lonman share will be 21 cents, 21.4 cents. What we're seeing there is humongous dilution. So for every one share that currently exists, there will be 49 shares after that. Whereas in the case of Taste, they're doing a, 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 a rights issue what they're doing, I think it is uh, for every one, for every hundred shares you hold, you get 42 rights. So it's 0 0.42. Those rights are called nil paid letters, NPLs. Those NPLs have value because that NPL entitles you to buy a share at a price. In the case of Lonman, you can buy one Lonman share at 21.4 cents. In the case of taste, you can buy one taste share at three rand. So those nil paid letters trade on the JSC. They are appended with an N after the code. So uh, Arsenal Mittel goes A-C-L-N, taste is T-A-S-N, Lonman will be L-O-N-N. -N. They have an expiry date. And if you receive them, if you, if you were holding taste shares a few weeks ago and you got your nil paid letters, you then got those in your account, you have to do one of two things. You have to sell them in the market, and the price is quite simple. Current share price minus take up price. So taste, share price 3 rand 10, take up 3 rand, value of nil paid letter, 10 cents. And they act almost geared. Because if the taste share price goes from 310 to 320, and taste is life, that's 3% move. No, 1% move, tiny move. But the nil paid will go from 10, 10 cents to 20 cents. So it's almost a geared play already. So you either have to go and sell it in the market to somebody else, or you have to exercise your right and take them up. And if you want to do that, contact your broker and make sure that they know this. There is, the default is they expire worthless. So if you want to buy those taste shares at three bucks a pop, contact your broker and say, I've got those nil paid letters, I want to take up my taste shares, please. A couple of important points. At the moment, taste is trading at two rand ninety-five. So value of the nil paids, zero. So if you've got nil paids, you can't sell them. Why would you go and buy a share at three rand when you could buy it in the open market at two ninety five? Now, for me and you, that's true because we're buying a couple of thousand rands worth, perhaps. It's different if you're an institution. You know, if you want to buy 
50 million rand of taste. Well, you can't buy that at three rand, so maybe you do go through the, the rights issue. And then there's some nuances. Is it underwritten? By underwritten, I mean that, in other words, if, they're not, if not all the shares are taken up, a third party comes along and buys the rest and all of that sort of thing, which gives some levels of security. How much are you paying for the privilege? So Lonman is paying $38 million to raise the money. In other words, the lawyers and bankers are getting rich. Everybody else, maybe, maybe not. Um, but must be taken up or sold. The trick is, how do these work in the derivative space? So broadly, a stockbroker has two options. A, a derivative broker has two options. They can take those no-paid letters and give you a derivative on it. So you received some Arsenal Mittel, you were long of Arsenal Mittel, and as a shareholder, you got Arsenal Mittel no paids, and now you've got an Arsenal Mittel no paid CFD. But as I said a moment ago, a no paid is almost a CFD anyway, so now you've got a CFD squared. So what most brokers do is take those no paids, sell them for whatever they can in the open market on the first day that they arrive, and deposit the cash into your account which is my preferred way. If, I'm, if, as a, if I was holding a CFD, I'll give me the cash. What you will find is that there will be a fall in the share price when there's no paid trade into the market, as it sort of resets itself. And it's not always the worst thing. I mean, Discovery did one a while ago. That was a perfectly good one. The taste rights issues are perfectly good. I mean, I have said to people, don't take up your rights, because I think you will be able to buy taste at below three rand. But they've got a good reason for it. They need a lot of money to roll out Debonair, um, Domino's, and uh, Starbucks. So it's not always about the company going bust. It often is, but not always. Um, so it's about this, oh, sorry. It's a critical point, and, and, and it's the key point, and it's how I'm going to come to the last slide of the presentation. It's not always a case of which was right or wrong. It's know which way it happens. If my broker gives me no paid CFDs, that's fine. I'm just going to go sell them. But I need to know that they do give them to me so that I can go and sell them. And if they give me cash, I prefer cash, but I'm, you know, I'm agnostic. I'm not upset if I get the no paids. I just need to know. I go sell them, and I move on with my life. It's about knowing what way they do it. And then there's something called book builds, which is where, and uh, Nepi does a lot of them, uh, Breit has done a couple and others, where simply they go and sell new shares to select shareholders. And it's not always, when I say select, sometimes they open it. It's kind of like a private placement. And then you get accelerated book builds, where they announce it at 9 o'clock in the morning, and at 10 o'clock they tell you they've just raised $25 billion, all's good, and the new shares will come in. Those usually happen beyond our, our, our eyesight. I mean, we, we see the sense announcements. But um, I've never been phoned to partake in a book build. Uh, and if I was, I'd probably decline because they usually, when they say, do you want one, two, or three, they're talking in millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions, not in rands and cents. Um, and there's no no paids or anything like that. Typically, we see those via cents. That is still dilution because there are more shares in issue. Those shares have a lifelong perpetual right on, the, on a share of profits. The flippers, and I don't have a slide for it, which is a share buyback, where the company goes into the market, uses their free cash, buys shares in the market, tears them up, throws them away. That's brilliant, because what are they doing? They're reducing the number of shares that have claim on future profit. The problem is that far too often companies, as I said, they do the buyback at the top and the rights issue at the bottom. So Angler was buying back shares at 450 Rand, and now they're at 100 and something. They just, they, apart from Yanni Maton and PSG, they usually get it the wrong way around. <clears throat> suspended shares, there are a few things worse in life than a suspended share. I mean, I, there must be. I can't off the top of my head think of any. A suspended share is just that. You cannot buy it. You cannot sell it. So, a book board can be a book board can be when an existing shareholder wants to exit. So Glasgow Kleinsmith and Aspen owned 18.6% of Aspen, and they've done two book boards selling 6.2 each time. And basically, Glasgow Kleinsmith has said we don't want to be long-term shareholders. So every 18 months they take 6.2% of of it, and they 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 do a book board to sell it into the market. That's not new shares, and book boards are usually done at discount. 
I mean, rights issues, or they, these are usually done at a discount. So there are some book boards which are, are, are price agnostic. Although, in the case of Aspen, every time a book board gets announced, the share falls. The first time it recovered, this last time it hasn't yet recovered, um, but it's still the same company. I mean, Glasgow Klein Smith took that 18.6% stake. At the time, they said, we are not long-term shareholders of Aspen. So the, you know, the market gets a spook every time it happens, but the market shouldn't. So that's not new shares, and that's that, and that in truth, Aspen gets nothing from that. They don't get money; they get all they get is different shareholders, and that that's moot. So suspended shares are literally that. The JC comes along and says that share can no longer be traded until further notice. In the case of MTN last Monday, it was about four and a half hours. That's fine. In the case of one time, it's been about two years. In the case of African Bank, about two years. In the case of Sumbo, nine years. Now look, when a bank goes bust, there is a lot to do. It takes a long time to wind it up. Um, there's another stock, Benita, I think, been suspended for years. Um, Alliance Mining, been suspended since 2008. Why is a company suspended? Leaked information, so in the case of, 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 the JS, of, of MTN, the JC felt that there was information out there and in fact, MTN requested that uh, the JSC suspend trading until such time as that information can be disseminated. We had an example a couple of years ago, in truth, many years ago, six or seven years ago, with ABSA. They were publishing their results, I think it was on a Friday, but someone made a mistake and put an advert in Financial Mail, which is published on Thursday. So suddenly, they haven't published their results on Sense, but I've got the highlights from an advert a day before. So it took a little bit of time for anyone to work this out. But as soon as they did, they suspended ABSA shares, said no more trading until tomorrow. Why? Because all price-sensitive information must go via Sense first and foremost. So in the case of ABSA, in the case of MTN, in both of those examples, the companies requested that their shares were suspended until they could issue the Sense announcement. And that's fine. That's no real stress. A couple of hours, maybe a day. When Arsenal Metal forgot to sign the Scission Iron Ore Rights contract um, and they requested a suspension of the shares, the shares were suspended for about three weeks while they tried to negotiate with Kumba. And during those three weeks, you can't trade them. And if you're holding a derivative position, you're paying interest. And in the case of Arsenal Metal, when they resumed trading, they went down about 35%. And I don't mean a gentle swan dive. I mean they suspended there and opened 35% lower. I mean they forgot to sign the most important contract in their life. You know, it's like, I can't think of another analogy. So I, I can't think of another analogy. Um, so those were nasty examples. It's a bit agnostic sometimes. So if you have a guaranteed stop, it's a great question. So whilst the share is suspended, you're not getting stopped out because there's no price. As soon as it opens, so in the case of Arsenal Metal, it went from there to there. If your guaranteed stop is there, boom, that's where you are. Quick point on that. If your provider offers guaranteed stops, take it every single time. Every single time. Costs a bit of money, but take it. Always, always use guaranteed stops. So I mean, there's, there's, there's means and ways. For example, African banks. African bank hit the wall. There were some brokers out there, such as 361, who were short the position, right? They now want to close their position. So they were buying back shares that, from people that were suspended. So if you had had African bank shares, they were buying them back at four or five cents per share. So you could maybe wiggle out. But they weren't buying many. I mean, I don't know how. They wanted a couple of million, perhaps, at most. A suspended share is your worst nightmare. And, you know, again, when it happened with the MTN and the ABSA example, that's not a problem. Well, I mean, MTN, different story, but nonetheless. Arsenal Metal, I mean, could you have seen that coming? No. No, I mean, today you can. But back then, this is back 2007, Arsenal Metal is a top 40 stock. It's, you know, it's rocking, it's rolling, it makes steel. We can't make enough steel on planet Earth. That is, called a, bla that is a black swan event to your portfolio. It is absolutely. And how do you manage that? With overall portfolio man risk management. 
If you were ge geared to the gills on, on Arsenal Mittal on that trade, well, you wouldn't be here today because you wouldn't have any gills left. <laughs> if you were gently trading within decent risk parameters, you would still have the scars. And I can tell none of you were because I'm not seeing any nervous twitches. But you would only have a nervous twitch. You would still be alive. That's what's important. Other reasons, so you break the JSC rules. The JSC says that you have to publish results within three months. Break it, get suspended. Uh, business rescue. Company goes into business rescue, you come, and that's, that's, the, that's the worst one. You know, Arsenal Mittler, you knew it was going to come back. You didn't know what price it was going to come back at, and you didn't know when, but you figured it would be ugly, and it would be a couple of weeks or a couple of months. African Bank is already two years, and is until, I mean, shareholders are not going to see anything for a couple more years. So the business rescue is the worst one. And business rescue is something you can see. A, co a company that's publishing great results doesn't suddenly wake up one day and go into business rescue. I mean, who are the business rescues? One time, um, uh, uh, Protec, uh, Protec Kamala, uh, uh, African Bank. These are guys, we saw the warning on the wall, we saw the writing. Not for a week or two or three beforehand, for a year or two beforehand, we could see the problems. What did we do? We ignored the advice on the first slide, we threw good risk management out the window, and we thought, let's go big. Ha! This is how we're going to get rich and impress the Joneses. We're going to buy African bank shares at 50 cents. How bad can it be? You know how bad it can be? 100%. And it's worse. For the next couple of years, every time you log into your portfolio, what do you see? African bank shares. So here's a caveat. You can phone CompuShare and you can donate shares to CompuShare, which they will then bulk up and sell and give the money to charity. And they will take suspended shares. It might be a bit nasty to the charity. You should perhaps pony in 100 bucks as well, just because, you know... <laughs> Thinking about it, giving a charity suspended shares is perhaps mean and nasty, but nonetheless, um, this is the worst thing that can happen to you. Sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's not important, and like Arsenal Mittal, it was just left field, we never saw it coming. Point is, don't ever make it your fault. That company that looks touch and go, don't touch, go. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Because more times than not, and I've been playing this market for 30 years, more times than not, that touch-and-go company goes bust. And not like six out of ten times, like nine, nine and a half out of ten times, that touch-and-go company goes bust. And the two right now that I wouldn't touch, Lonman and Avenge. I was joking outside about Kumba. I do not think Kumba will go bust. There are people who do, I do not. Lonman and Avenge wouldn't touch them. You know, do you wake up one morning and they're gone? Cool. So you were going, so, so a, 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 a half-decent stockbroker will always hedge your position. So if you go long, what do they do? They go and buy the shares in the market. So if the shares go up, you've made a profit. Cool. They owe you that profit, but they've got the profit from the shares. So they take that profit, they pass it to you. They don't make money on your being right or wrong. They make money on interest. They make money on spreads. They make it everywhere else. When you go short, they go sell shares into the market. They've got to have those shares to sell them. They've got to be able to borrow them. And if they can't borrow a sufficient quantity, they simply don't sell, and therefore they won't allow you to trade into it. So it's them unable to get... And you were trying to short Lonman. Yeah. So, so Lonman is a case in point. So a couple of things happen, particularly in the Lonman example, is where folks are just saying, you know what, people who have shares are, are actually not lending them out because they're just so skittish. I was short Lonman, but with physical script, not geared. And I got my script recalled mistake I made is he gave me 20 days to return it and I closed my trade on Friday yeah so they simply couldn't hedge their position you know what and as much as we begrudge them because you could have made money and it's like Meh, we want them to hedge their positions because if they're not hedging they're taking risk and if they're taking risk they might go bust so there's things you can do. The question is, if you, even if you've got to stop, while they suspended, you're still paying interest. What you can do is actually ask to be physically delivered the shares. So let's say you had uh, 10,000 ABLES, African banks, and, but you had CFDs, so you had 10,000 African bank CFDs. Your CFD provider probably has 10,000 ABLE shares for you. 
you're paying interest. You can phone them up and say, look, guys, this is me. No, can I physically actually receive those 10,000 African bank shares? No more interest to pay. You still own 10,000 suspended shares, but you're stopped paying interest. And that is, you know, I, I've, I've never tried to do that, but that would certainly be my first point of call to see if I could at least stop the interest payment. <laughs> leaked information. Leaked information is, so in the case of MTN, the, yeah, in the leaked information, it's 100% MTN's fault. They've handled this. I mean, there is a head in the sand, and then there's MTN. Um, but usually leaked information is agnostic. The JC rules breach, nasty. Business rescue, very nasty. Uh, about, so far, stats for South Africa, about 15% of companies come out of business rescue. In America, about 28% of companies come out of Chapter 11. If it's that bad, most don't come out the other end. Quick point on share structure. This is just because there's potential trades here. So what we have in the world is authorized and issued shares. So a company says, we have 1 million authorized shares, but we only issue 900,000, which means the free float out there being traded is 900,000. 100,000 shares are kept locked up in a safe. And if they want, they will issue those shares via a book build or a rights issue to raise more capital. Okay, nice, not critically important. But then we get something called share consolidation and share splits. And these, we have opportunities to make some money in the trading space. A share consolidation reduces the number of shares and increases the share price. So you have a share trading at 10 cents. And there are 1,000 shares in issue. And they say, we don't like 10 cents, so we're going to reduce the number of shares from 1,000 to 100. And therefore, the, so you decrease the quantity by tenfold, you increase the price by tenfold. So the value of the company remains exactly the same. It's just an accounting, <coughs> smoke and mirrors. A share, con a share split is the other way around. NASPAS, shares are trading at 2,000 Rand. People are like, oh, I can't buy NASPAS, I haven't got 2,000 Rand. So NASPAS says, cool, you know what we'll do? We'll do a share split. We'll make the shares 200 Rand each, and the quantity of shares will increase tenfold. So if you'd had 10 NASPAS at 2,000 Rand each, that's 20 grand. They do the split, you've now got 100 NASPAS at 200 Rand each, 20 grand. No difference, no difference, except for human psychology. And here's how you trade it. You go short a consolidation and you go long a split. Shares that do the split go higher, Shares that consolidate go lower. And it's quite simple. Consolidations are, that, so that shares are 10 cents, and it's difficult to find a level because the difference between 9 and 10 cents is, is 10%. So you can't really find a level, and then you cons and, tch, and the bottom falls out. And look at the examples, RBA, Protec, always. I mean, Kojima did three consolidations, just kept on falling and falling. The inverse is share split. Because whether you buy, if you're buying 20,000 of NASPAS, whether you get 10 NASPAS or 100 NASPAS, makes no difference. You have 20,000. But there are people out there who are like, no, I don't trade NASPAS. I haven't got 2,000 Rand. Suddenly it's 200. So it creates excitement and hype. Remember the whole story around up here? Right sector, excitement and hype? I've never seen, and when I say I've never seen, I'm a stress. Just because I've never seen it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. I've never seen a share split that didn't add at least 5 or 10% to the price in the couple of days after it happened. So if a share is doing a split, and the split day is tomorrow, go along today. Hold three days, take your money and run. It's the easy, it, this, that is the easiest money in the JSC. The bad news, the last share split was Investec in 2007. We just haven't seen one in 100 years. But there's a couple of potential candidates floating around. Uh, Capitec, um, NASPASS, those are the two I'm looking for. Capitec does a share split. That thing's going to, forget the moon, man, it's going to go way past the moon. And I'm biased, I love Capitec, I own it, I love it, I should even go and bank there. I don't yet. So, consolidations, short them, splits, go along on them. Yeah, at some point, look, at some point they <coughs> actually know the JC can handle share prices up to a million rand. They'll split soon enough. The key point, know how your broker manages them. 
you know, I have preferences in many cases for what I would prefer. In truth, what's more important is know how your broker manages it. And in many cases, it's not just a case of there's a, you know, you're actually going to have to phone someone and perhaps, you know, find an intelligent person and stuff like that. Know how, know how the broker manages it. Know when they're happening so that you kept, so that if there are no pages that are going to suddenly arrive, you know what to do. So, you know, know when and then try and anticipate. The anticipating is less of, a, of, of an issue. And what, that basically is manage the risk part. But most important, know how your broker manages them. So to end, I thought we were going to Aristotle, hey, why not? Let's go back 4,000 years. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. And I've used this before, this example, but I'm going to give it to you again. Tiger Woods, I don't know what it was, I'm not a golf man, but he's standing on, in the rough at the edge of the green, and he chips his ball in, and it goes, wee, boop, and falls in the hole, and the world goes wild, and Tiger Woods wins. This was when he could still play golf. The world goes wild, and Tiger Woods wins. I think it was the PGA or something like that. Afterwards, this journalist is going home, and he sees Tiger Woods standing on the practice green in the rough with a bucket of 100 balls chipping them in. And the journalist goes to Tiger Woods and says, that's the most incredible shot I've ever seen. Why the hell are you practicing it? Tiger Woods' answer, how do you think I do it so well? Practice. Practice. I spoke about it when I spoke about unconscious competence. How do we make that work? Repetition. So in Tiger Woods' case, what does he do? Exactly the same position of the feet, shoulders, arms, the whole, you know, same club. Everything exactly the same. We as traders need to have process. And our edge as a trader is our adherence to that process. That's what makes the difference. The homework, as always, and we come back to this a bit in December and then again in, in Jane and then for the very, very last session, is what are you trading? The whys, the hows, and, you know, we tend to fall in stuff. You know, oh, why are you trading Bitcoin? Hey, because IG offer it. Yeah, okay, but why are you trading Bitcoin? You know, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm saying that IG offers it is not an answer. You, know, you need to say to me, because it's completely uncorrelated to everything on the face of the earth, that is a good answer. Cool. Go trade Bitcoin. Interrogate everything. Say, ask yourself, why am I doing this? Not because there's a better way, but because interrogate. Why am I doing it this way? Why not that way? And the things to consider always, emotions, risk, strategy, discipline, exposure, knowledge. I'm not going to touch on that. I'll come to that in a second. December, we're busting market myths. So all those things like Southern Way and other silly poems, Santa rallies, presidential cycles. How much money do we need? How to get rich very quickly. I mean, very, very quickly. Um, I'll tell you that right now. How to get rich in a hurry. Simplest thing in the world. Marry money. Yes. Nothing else. Marry money. Not lotto, not nothing else. Um, and then we carry on again from 19th of January running through to 21 of June. Lawyers, just in case, contact details. Questions? Cool. Ladies and gents, I'm going to park it there. I'll conclude with... So this evening was a bit of a more dry presentation. It's, it's not the fun and exciting and jumping up and down, but it's those small little things on the margins that make the differences. You know, if you're doing all right trading and you suddenly get caught out by something and it, it hits you hard, that can set you back, not just financially, but emotionally at the same time. Um, and often it's those small little things that we hadn't actually thought about, or we had thought about, but we thought about, we'll worry about it tomorrow. Well, worry about it tomorrow. Not tomorrow's tomorrow, real tomorrow. Ladies and gents, we'll see you in a month. Thank you very much for your time.